Welcome to Real Leaders with Rashini, the podcast with real talk, real questions, real insight, and we hope real inspiration for real. We're here at Capitol Grill in downtown Minneapolis. My guest today is Tane Danger. He's the host of the Theater of Public Policy. He's also the host of a new web series for Metro Transit in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, called, Hey, Where Does This Bus Go? And we'll find out more about him, uh, but I'm letting him eat because today happens to be his birthday. And he was just surprised by our host at Capitol Grill with a birthday dessert. Tane, happy birthday. Thank you. This is uh, this is so sweet. This is the earliest in the morning I've ever been given birthday cake, and I'm not <laughs> upset by it. That's wonderful. That's well, great. We are honored that you know you took the day off for your birthday, but you're spending some of it with us. I'm so, thank you. This is this is very nice. And Capitol Grill has amazing cheesecake and chocolate. Yes, and I'm going to have some chocolate as I ask you the first question, Go nuts. which is how in 2011 did you decide to start the theater of public policy, and what is it? <laughs> I understand the Star Tribune describes it as C-SPAN invaded by the cast of Saturday Night Live. Yes, that's my favorite description. Uh, so, 2011, so I had a background working in... Um, Civic good, uh, sort of civic do-gooderism is sometimes how I shorthand it. So I worked for the state of Minnesota for a time at the state sesquicentennial. I worked at uh, some... Great pronunciation of that word, by Thank the way. You. That was, well, I was the communications director, oh. so I often <laughs> said my job was basically to just get people to say that word. Uh, so, um, so I worked at the state. I worked at both some local nonprofits and some international nonprofits, and... Uh, this whole time, improv was my fun thing. I did it sort of as a fun thing. In the sort of civic do-gooder world, I found sometimes folks in that space are not always great at telling their own story, or they might be good at telling their story, but they don't always tell their story in like a fun way, in a way that, you know, there's a lot of sometimes like, hey, everybody, stuff is stuff is really problematic. Or it's so serious. It's like very serious. Like you guys really need to care about this. Take um, it seriously. And it's like that. I'm always like, Cry. yes, that's true, maybe. Uh, but, you know, we kind of you limit your audience probably for who's going to come out for that. And so it's like, well, uh, improvisers are pretty good storytellers. Uh, maybe there's a way to bring those two things together, to use improv as a way to help tell some of those stories. And so I worked with my co-founder, Brandon Boat, who also had worked in some nonprofits, and did, we'd done improv together. And we said, uh, let's do a show where we talk to folks who have a, uh, a thing that they are passionate about, that they're working on, whether they you know work in government or whether they work in uh, the public sector or whether they work working uh, later on in, in corporate world, um, but somebody who's doing stuff to try and like make the world a better place or uh, make people aware of a variety of things. Let's talk to those people on stage and then use improv to bring to life all the things that they have talked about. Uh, so the way that the show works is just like that. I, uh, still all these years later, generally, is that I would uh, interview somebody on stage. Just Who a, is from that organization? Yes, uh, somebody. So it could, you know, we just finished up our last season and, you know, we had folks uh, from the state attorney general to people who are researchers at the University of Minnesota to people who work at, you know, nonprofits studying health care. That person, one person is a guest on the show, and I usually interview that person about their things. And it's a fun interview, but hopefully it's very substantive and we get to a lot of good, uh, meaty things. And then uh, the cast is listening to that. And immediately, like in real time, they take over the stage as soon as our interview is done. And their job is to craft improv comedy scenes out of whatever we just talked about. So, so it could be recycling Yes, we actually did do, we did a whole show on with the folks from uh, Eureka Recycling. And actually, that was a really good one. There's a lot to recycling, how those systems work and whatnot. But the idea generally is, uh, you know, you, uh, A, it, it draws a different kind of crowd in. Because, you know, if I said to you, hey, uh, this coming Monday night, there's an hour and a half presentation about recycling. Uh, do you want to come with me? You might be like, wow, I have so much busyness that you I... got to put the garbage out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whereas if I said, hey, there's an improv comedy show all about recycling, you might be like, well, that's 
interesting and different. and different. So maybe I'll come out to that. And so you draw a different audience. And then also there's this like level of learning that happens because, and I get this all the time, folks will say, oh, you know, I'd always heard that it's like important to sort out your recycling and put this, that, and the other thing. And I never really knew why. But then when your cast did that scene where they were like the green bottles and the other guy was like the brown bottles and like they don't mix together because <laughs> like if their glasses get together, then they explode like that was that made it all make sense to me and I'm like great whatever works for you your job is yeah, done now exactly yeah, yeah. goal accomplished yeah. what has been a tough huh. organization or topic to cover in the theater of public policy there's a lot of shows that we get into that I'm like oh how did we get ourselves into this uh you know I I think that uh a ver- you know, there's a variety. We've had so what during the last gubernatorial race, we had you know several of the gubernatorial candidates on, including eventual Governor Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan together. And like with those, you know, we get into some like really serious issues. Sometimes we got into you know what Minnesota should or shouldn't do around gun control and things like that. Some of those are are really challenging. I mean, similarly, we had new Hennepin County Sheriff uh, um, uh, Dave Hutch on the show this past season and you know talking to him about like how uh incarceration works and how we're dealing with uh undocumented individuals here oh yeah Yeah. i mean how do you improv incarceration (laughs) yes and in a funny way well and the the answer is that you don't you the the humor is almost never like in uh like a person being incarcerated, right? Like we have a very strong rule about you don't ever punch down, right? Like you don't ever do humor that is uh, based on the person or the people who are already victimized somehow or already in a very uh, difficult place. Or dire straits. Or dire straits. What it usually is the humor is around is like the systems that we've built or created that almost everybody can agree aren't really doing what we want them to do, right? Like, I don't think, for the most part, anybody thinks like, oh, uh, it's great that we have this many people incarcerated or that, you know, we have, uh, you know, these sentences that do these things and aren't maybe actually changing what some of the crime statistics we want are. So, like, everybody can kind of agree on that. And yet, then you get down into, like, the weeds of, like, how we get to that. And that's where there's a lot of disagreement. But a lot of times there's just there's humor in sort of that juxtaposition of like oh what why can't we figure this out or like why can't we actually like talk about some of these or things or maybe even humor in some of the myths oh yeah that communities keep telling themselves yes yeah absolutely like uh you know we've actually done several shows around uh prison and and uh, incarcerated individuals and that is one of the big things is like you know people have an image of like what people who are like in prison or have been to prison are like and it's like oh no actually it's like uh, it's very different than that and it's like potentially everybody uh, that you see like right like it's it's you it's me I mean there's not sort of like a stereotype and so yeah trying to blow some of those stereotypes up is both important and actually usually sometimes like leads to some humor because there's like a level of surprise or uh to that something that people aren't expecting um so yeah i like it well really interesting how often does the theater play and can people find you easily I hope so. Uh, uh, so. I hope they can find us. Uh, so we do shows. We do a, a fall, summer, and spring season. And so every fall and spring, we're in Minneapolis, and we do shows every Monday night. Uh, and so, and then in the summer, we're in St. Paul, and we do shows every Tuesday night in St. Paul. And then we tour all over the place, and we go to colleges and universities and community centers and things like that. So if folks want to find us, which I hope that they do, uh, even after listening to me, is uh, they can go to t2p2.net. So it's the letter T, number two, letter P, number two, dot net. So it's like, That's very yeah. easy. Yeah. All right, let's talk about this love of improv. You are so passionate about it. Then in 2012, you partnered with your business partner mm. and you start and you really started taking it into museums. Yeah. Minneapolis Institute of Arts hired you to bring improv into the museum. And when I read that, I thought, what is that even about? How do you bring improv into an art museum? 
That's a great question. That we we're, uh, we spent part of that six months trying to figure that out. Um, so the way that that came about is we had some folks from MIA, at that time MIA, come to uh, one of our shows actually about water quality in Minnesota. And after the show, they said, wow, you got an entire audience to sit for an hour and a half learning about water quality in Minnesota. Can you do something similar around Rembrandt? We were like... <laughs> We can try. That's not a question you get every day. Yeah, exactly. Um, But uh, we did a variety of things. We did some shows similar to the public policy shows that we do. Uh, We did some trainings with the staff at uh, MIA, which I'm a big proponent of. I do a lot of workshops and trainings for folks trying to use the skills of improv to get people to think differently about leadership, collaboration, and creativity. And then some of my favorite stuff, though, that we did was we worked with the docents, the tour guides there, and we, like, developed different kinds of tours with them that used some of the improv skills or uh, mindsets that we have, some actual, like, improv games, you would say, like, to engage the audiences who are coming on those tours differently. So uh, one of my favorite tours that we worked with them on was something called the Liars Tour. And so the way that this tour worked is you had two docents take you on a tour of the museum and at each like thing that they would stop at, each piece of art, each one of them would tell a story about that piece of art. One of these stories was totally true and one was totally made up and they didn't tell you which was which. And so then everybody on the tour had little placards that they held up that said like true or false. Like, are you telling <laughs> the truth great. or lie? And I loved it because A, it's like very fun and engaging, but B, like people really leaned in because- in And every, listened. And listened and they were like trying to ferret out like, oh, is this the real thing or not? Um, and- this is a this is the thing that I'm most passionate about is like, you know, we want people to be paying attention, whether it's public policy, whether it's art, whether it's uh, our communities. And I think that, yes, that is totally what we should be doing. And if we want people to do that, we should make it fun. We should make it so that people actually want to do that. And playing a game with folks, inviting them to laugh as they're learning or uh, leaning into a big issue or idea uh, makes it so that they're self-selecting, that they're actually wanting to be there. And you really have to take your audience as you find them Mm -hmm. and really seek to accomplish your intent, but in the way they need to receive you and digest you and hear you and feel you. And it sounds like that's what you teaching the docents at the (laughs) Minneapolis Institute of Art or other people there really how to understand their audience better and use these skills to ultimately accomplish the goals of the museum. I mean, this is that it's that's a brilliant point. Like, and I think that you're spot on. the The thing that I say whenever I teach improv and and uh, to folks and some of these skills that are related to it is the most important thing that improvisers have to be really strong at. Uh, It's not being quick on your feet. It's not being sharp-witted or funny. It's being a really good listener. Uh, Because when I'm on stage, if you and I are doing an improv scene together, I have to be listening really closely to like what you're offering me and what our scene is about. And where is, as you said, the audience right now? And are they with us or do we need to do something? And one of the things, again, I really try and emphasize is that listening is not sort of a you're good at it or you're not good at it. It's a practice. It's something that you can exercise just the way you would exercise any muscle and that that is really important and it makes us all better at almost anything. Anything that we're trying to do that is collaborative or is public facing somehow, being a better listener will make us better at that. And so let's all practice that. And my big thing is that I think improv is a great way to practice it. It is. And you don't have to be perfect, but understanding it's a practice and you develop and get better over time speaking of finding your audience uh, you know as they are and listening to them your new series new as of 2019 hey where does this bus go first Mm -hmm. of all I love that title a web series for Metro Transit I've watched several episodes and I mean it is actually on real Metro Transit buses what is the concept behind this, Tane? Okay, so I love this because it's a it's a concept that was literally just something that I thought would be silly and fun, and then people actually said yes to it. Very good improv concept, saying yes and to an idea. So the concept is incredibly simple. 
buses can be sort of intimidating if you've ever been somewhere and you just see a bus go and you're like, I have no idea where that bus would go. I've had that feeling myself many times. And so I thought, what if I just did a thing where I got on a bus and just rode it from one end to the other, sort of noted things along the way and talked to people who were on the bus and tried to give people a sense of like, oh, hey, this is where this bus goes. That was like the entire idea. And I uh, talked to some folks at Metro Transit and to their amazing credit, they were like, sure, let's try that. Let's do that. And so, Hey, Where Does This Bus Go? is a web series that I do with Metro Transit where we take one, each episode, we take one bus route. I get on it at the very beginning of one end, uh, ride it all the way to its ending point and then all the way back. And as I said, sort of note some landmarks, some things along the way. So people who are watching have a sense of, oh, this bus goes from uptown Minneapolis all the way to, you know, Highland Park, St. Paul. And then the piece that's really neat, though, is that I chat with folks who are on the bus along the way and just talking to them about like, oh, wh- where are you going? What's on going on with the, the bus ride today? And, you know, it's miraculously wonderful how uh, these folks just sort of share. They're like, yeah, I'm, I'm on my way to work. Like I ride this bus every day or they say, oh, I'm on my way to school. I usually would be biking, but it's, you know, it's snowing today. I think somebody said to me once and you just get all these little snapshots. And there's snapshots. simple conversations. Oh, yeah. But the very fact you're taking interest in them probably matters to them. I hope so. Uh, and I, one of the things that I, I really hope is to show, like, to sort of highlight the fact, uh, spotlight the fact that people, everybody rides the bus, right? I do think that sometimes some folks we have like a stereotype or like, oh, those people ride the bus, right? Like, oh, that's that. But it's like, oh, once you actually are on a bus and hopefully with these videos, you see like, oh, no, it's like the business guy who works downtown uh, and it's the teacher who's going to school and it's the student who's like taking a, a yeah, it's a student who's taking a, a class at MCAD and all over and people who are coming in from the suburbs or going back out to the suburbs. And so trying to maybe just show like um, people who ride the bus are just just like just everybody like else. Us. Like I'm just, just like every day. Well, yeah. and here's what I'll say. And maybe you can help me with this insecurity when it comes to buses. I have no sense of direction. Oh, yeah. Me neither. No sense of direction. Right. I fear getting lost somewhere on a bus. Yeah. And my family <laughs> won't ever be able to find me. Now, that's a little drastic because I do have the cell phone. But that is what really is paralyzing for me. Oh, I get it. I I mean, I talked to uh, one of the early thoughts on making this series was there was a time when I wrote like early on when I was first starting to ride the bus here in the Twin Cities. I got on a bus and I thought I knew like what my stop was going to be, but it didn't seem like, oh, that wasn't quite right. And so I just kept riding it. And eventually we just got to the end of the route and the bus driver was like, this is the end of the line. I was like, I don't know where I am right now. <laughs> See, uh, that's exactly and it. He's like, "Well, I'm taking a 20 minute break." I was like, "Well, can I ride back with you when you're done?" <laughs> and he said, "Sure." And then he went out, like, uh, stepped outside the bus, had a cup of coffee. I just sat on the bus in embarrassment, and eventually we got back. So uh, this was long before you did this the series. Is long before I did the series. Although, I mean, a that's part of the c- idea of the series. Isn't that is great? That, so yeah. those kinds of experiences, yeah, can really spawn some wonderful yeah. ideas. But you should not be intimidated because okay. uh, a like uh metro transit bus drivers every single one i've ever met is amazing and a hero and i'm a really big advocate of this because i really believe they have like the one of the hardest jobs in the oh world oh my god like, i could never do it i mean i think that driving a bus generally is very scary and intimidating and then driving a bus full of all kinds of people uh who all maybe are asking you questions or whatnot and yet they do it with this grace and like humility and generosity so if you're ever like unsure you can always ask a, a bus driver also there's this thing there's this app on our phones these i have it's called google maps yeah. Yes. I don't know if it's, you've heard of it. It has been life changing for uh, me. And it, Let me tell you, it does bus routes. Oh, uh, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, so you can just ask it like, "Where do I?" And it'll. It even does bus routes with transfers. It'll say like, "Oh, wow. we're in downtown." See, the right transfer now. is another layer of stress. Yeah. 
Oh, this yeah. is good. No, it's you yeah. have taught me a lot today about and you're, blessing. You'll you'll be connected with. You're already pretty connected with the. No, community, but I think this but, would yeah. be really good for for my own just kind of getting over some of my sense of direction issues. Yeah, and really having some empowerment. Well, and after doing it a few times, you do see the city and do see the places that you are differently than you would driving past them. Exactly. Like it, you know, when you're focused on driving or whatever, when you can actually like look out the window and be like, oh. Oh, look at there's a sidewalk cafe there that I never noticed before. No, it's brilliant. It's lovely. Well, I wish you so much luck with hey, where does this bus go? My prediction for okay. this web series yes. is that Netflix is gonna pick it up. <laughs> This is my prediction. Have you already been talking with? Them? I have not been. I love that idea that uh, Netflix will let's pick get up. on it. Yeah, can do you know? Let's get on that. Okay, bus. okay. Let's, let's get, get on, on the bus. Netflix bus. Uh, I can't say I have any, you know, friends at Netflix, but this is my prediction, and I'm not even saying it in jest because this is such a cool idea. And I mean, have you seen some of Netflix things? I was They're just about to a say a lot less lower quality than what you're doing. right Netflix now. Netflix is picking so up just about you. everything so these I'm days. Saying so yeah, this this is the future. <laughs> For this web series. And uh, you heard that prediction prediction here. All right. You are a high energy person, Tane. It's kind of hard to ignore that fact. What do you do to unwind? Do Um, you ever? Oh, no. I unwind. Um, What do I do to unwind? I'm I'm trying to garden a lot this summer. Uh, Although gardening, I... You know, gardening is either incredibly unwinding or incredibly winding up, depending on sort of how it's going. I have a few plants that are are just really helping me out in terms of unwinding, and then a few that just are pushing my buttons. But maybe that's the beauty of it. Yeah, absolutely, that's the beauty of it. Uh, I'm very I'm very much into uh, meditation. I do a lot of meditation. I um, I describe myself as a very bad Buddhist. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so. Yeah, I do. I mean, I again, I don't know if you're like this. You interview people a lot and and you're sort of talking to, you know, strangers like me a lot. And so you do like I there's a part of this that is very satisfying and and uh wonderful. And then there's also like you like and now I need to like go and sort of like be Well, everyone by needs refresh time. Yeah. No matter what your work is, you need that refresh time. It's what keeps you going and then it also helps power your passion. Right, yeah. So I always ask that because leaders like you, you're not always going, going, going. I mean, that would not be good. No. You're doing no. a lot, but you can't always be going, going, going. Yes, I know. I um, I don't know. Do you, I, that's true. And to be like transparent and vulnerable. like And to use an improv technique. Uh uh, do you, I, I just feel like I do like re- like yesterday because today is my birthday. Uh, I was like, OK, I'm going to take the afternoon off and like go and sit by a lake. And so I did. And it's like wonderful. The sun, I feel like, is very um, therapeutic. And I, I grew up in Florida, so I miss like regular sunlight during the winter here. But then you also have like this pang of like guilt, like, oh, I should be I should be doing something. See, here's right what now. I will tell you. Guilt is a wasted emotion. It's a wasted emotion, and it cuts in on your refresh time yeah. and your fun. I So you weren't, like I was, raised by a Lutheran minister then. I was raised by uh, Sri Lankan parents. Sri Lankan. Uh, my mother is one of the original Tiger Moms. Wow. Uh, Asian. We're Asian. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we're, def- we're Catholic. Catholic. Right. I just, I you know, I, I just, um, I feel like there is something in that sort of, you know, Lutheran or like, you know, uh, upbringing some, that, you know, you get a lot of like, oh, uh, well, what, why are you sitting? Like, there's there's work to be done right now. Um, and not explicitly like that. Like, I'm not saying my but parents would. But yeah, you get sort of that, there's that Protestant work ethic yeah. thing that you You got to let go of a team. Okay. Oh Guilt is a wasted use, emotion. Yeah. I'm even thinking this cheesecake is delicious and I, yeah. I'm going to go for... Let this birthday kind of start a new leaf for you. You've you've had birthday cake early. Very early. Earliest you've ever had it. Earliest. Now let's just get let go of guilt. Okay. All right. So here <laughs> we are. That was easy. Here we are in Capitol Grill. They brought you this great birthday dessert. If you were a spirit or a wine or a cocktail, mm-hmm. what would Tane Danger be? You have a great name, by the way. Your drink, Your name could be a drink name. It is. Uh, <laughs> not yet. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm just, my head is immediately going to what my favorite cocktails are, which 
is maybe not the cocktail I would be. You know, so my favorite cocktails, like in the winter, it's like a Manhattan, which is very like strong and yeah, you know, very uh, wintry, spirit forward. And then right now it's warmer. I drink a lot of Negronis, a lot of Negronis. No, <laughs> it's a fine, uh, a, a moderate, like safe, healthy amount. Yes, of Negronis. you should have as many as you want on your birthday, though. Um, I probably, I mean, the the Campari, it's fun to think like I would be, that Campari would be part of my sort of uh, cocktail. Drink. Okay. Because, yeah, that's fruity and flavorful. We can just and, call it the Tain Danger. Yeah, instead of the Negroni, yeah. The Tain Danger. Yeah, that's that's You do a little safe. added twist to it. Yeah. You put uh, in your own little danger yeah. twist. What could I do? You know, I will say, I, I did make a handful of Negronis with a uh, local distillery Tattersall's uh, version of Campari. Uh, this is just a shameless like request for Tattersall to like have me endorse well, their product and like send them the podcast. Yes. We're talking about them on this podcast. Yes, if they want to send me some bottles of right. their version of Campari and or I, name it or name you. it after me, right. I will make all of my Campari drinks uh, <laughs> with their the, their product. And when forward. you sign with Netflix, yeah, they can come right along for the ride. Drink one of those on every bus ride. I don't know. I think you're allowed to do that. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that you can drink alcohol on the bus. No? Oh, well. Well, that's for another, yeah. hey, where does this bus go and what can you drink on it? Yeah, exactly. Episode. That's going to be the, uh, <laughs> hey, where does this bus go after dark? Uh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tane Danger, such a pleasure to spend your birthday with you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. This was such an honor. And I really can't say thank you. Uh, thank you and your folks here and the staff at the Capitol Grill for a birthday cake. Uh, that was so nice. Thank you. They love to make people smile. It worked. Until next time, keep it real.